Lecture 31. We're just about through with Volume 3 of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, your next assignment after this, your next handout after this, will take you right through to 3 Nephi, Chapter 7, and immediately after that we go into the crucifixion uh, of Christ, his resurrection and appearance on this continent. So the fourth volume is extremely exciting material, but a little different approach. It's the same approach that we used last year. It will take me about another year to finish the fourth volume. Much of the material is available to you in the fourth volume that I cover in lecture, but uh, the, the, um, the style is a little different. I ask you questions instead of uh, sort of tell the story and leave the blanks. There are blanks to fill in just like we have now. But with your next assignment now, you'll be finishing uh, volume three, which is your complete text of some uh, 400 pages. And then from then on, you'll be in volume four. And uh, you can just combine them together, actually. It won't be as voluminous as this material, and you'll be able to get your homework done a little sooner. <coughs> now, may I spin very rapidly through the period from um, 23 B.C. down to the prophet Samuel, just to make sure you got the, uh, the events chronologically in your mind. What we're talking actually happened to a human being. This isn't something they dreamed up in Hollywood. Uh, this actually occurred to a man who was president of the church, had formerly been the most popular political figure in, among all the Nephites, and they'd elected him chief judge. He then had given it up in the midst of a revolution and civil war, had uh, been remarkably successful in uh, converting Lamanites and, and uh, turning the tide of the war and getting the enemy to capitulate and not only give up the land but give up their sins, which was even more important. He had then gone up into the land northward where the war was not being fought to see if they could keep this tremendous tide of uh, conversion going and had failed. And after six years, he came back down out of the land northward and found the fruits of his labors practically wiped out among the Nephites by the Gadiantans taking over and getting everybody to become immoral, uh, to become thieves, selfish, and it reflected itself politically, all the Gadiantans had taken over. Now, in the Middle East, they very often build these very lovely garden towers. And you get out there where you're kind of against the highway, and you can sit out there and drink your zasparilla, and you can kind of look up and down and watch the people come and go. Over in Holland and Scandinavia, you sit in your front room where it's cold, I mean, it's cold outside, so you sit in your front room and you watch the people go up and down the street with a mirror. You have a mirror right outside your, your window. And, and it's called a, a gossip window. You get to see everybody who talks to who and who's dating who and so forth. Coming over on this side. So you can watch everybody going up and down. In the Arabian countries, they do it with lattice work. In Spain uh, and the Moorish uh, architecture provided for an extension over the sidewalk and it's all in lattice where you can sit up there and look through the lattice nobody can see you you can see them uh, and of course the lattice would open which the girls would do accidentally when the right men came down the, the street but anyway everybody has a, a method here of overlooking the highway <clears throat> in the Nephite days they apparently had these towers that were in their gardens right next to the highway. You sit up there in the cool of the day under the shade of the trees and watch people go up and down. Now when Nephi got up in his garden tower, he seems to have started out by just meditating. He looked across the city. He's, he's right downtown apparently. Uh, he's, he lives in one of the old uh, family homes and it's very close to downtown. And people are coming in, going out. And he gets to talking to the Lord and pretty soon he starts crying and talking to the Lord, and he said, how could this happen to these people? And what can we do now? And he starts lamenting about what's happening to the city, and it gets to be quite, uh, what should we say, um, vocal. So that's what attracted the crowd. And they, they're all standing down. This is a famous house, you know. They show this to tourists when they come through. This is Nephi's house. He used to be the chief judge. He's president of the church we used to belong to. And... Um, all of a sudden, he's up here making all these noises of great distress. 
So they all gathered around. Nephi looks down and sees they're all there. And he says, it's your fault that I'm having to go through this anguish and plead with God for you. And he started in on them. All right, now, the crowd not only was just common, ordinary people going to the marketplace, it included some what? Some of the judges and leaders of the people. And as he went on, he started denouncing the, the Gadianton cult. Now, that's like uh, saying uh, the Republican Party is responsible for all the evils that are happening at this time. Or in an earlier administration, saying all the Democrats are responsible for the terrible things that are happening. And you're going to have some Republicans in one case and some Democrats in the other that just aren't going to like what you say. In this case, it was the local politicians. They happened to belong to the Gadianton Party. And they just weren't about to take this. Now, instead of going up and dragging him down off the tower themselves, uh, which would have been a very undignified thing for them to do, who did they try to get to do it? Who did they try to get to uh, take action against this man for denouncing their particular party and program? Tried to get the, mob, the crowd to do it. Tried to stir up mob action. Um, why did it say they were afraid to do it themselves? Who were they afraid of? Yeah, they're afraid of the people. The people are kind of impressed with Nephi. He was saying that the administration was corrupt and all kinds of things were wrong with it. And um, they were saying, yeah, we kind of suspected something was wrong. And they're, they're kind of listening. And they, uh, these judges decided they would try and turn the people against them rather than take any action themselves. While they're discussing it among themselves and arguing back and forth, it gave... Um, Nephi a chance to number one think up what else he'd like to say to them which was plenty and all of a sudden the Lord came along and gave him a revelation so when he starts talking again he really unloaded on them and he not only gave them a tremendous um, call to repentance and a denunciation it was almost like Jeremiah talking when he would lay down in pure testimony against the people and say, and now you rejected God, and now your city's left unto you desolate, and Solomon's temple is coming down, and the Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians are going to sweep you down, and most of you will be killed, and the rest carried off into captivity. That's the way Jeremiah used to talk. Now Nephi got almost that strong. Then right at the end he said, at this very moment, your chief judge has just been murdered by his brother and they never caught that by his brother business did they <coughs> even though it's recorded Nephi say, wrote in his record and Mormon copied it he warned them in the beginning it was his brother that killed him the only thing they heard was he's been murdered and uh, so that's when the five individuals decided to go down we'll, we'll check on that that's one thing you can check on this fellow for did they believe uh, when they went down there to check did they suspect that maybe he was uh, right now they went down doubting, didn't they? So they go into, now notice how fast, notice the, the transition here. The man is murdered. The man who did it, his brother, escapes. The servants come in and see it. They rush out to get the crowd, to tell the people the chief judge has been murdered. While they're gone, in come the five. See how fast that happened? The spirit of the Lord struck them, down they went. And they are communicating the spirit world for briefly. They have a real quick treatment. And meanwhile, the crowd comes back, finds the five men down. So what do they say? Aha, uh -huh, God struck them down and didn't let them escape. They killed him. We've got the man. So they threw them into prison. The word goes out, chief judge, judge murdered, the five guilty, thrown in prison. Headlines, town crier, whatever they used. Next day, they have the state funeral. Now, when they had the, held the state funeral the following day, naturally the judges of the day before, they're there in their regal robes. I mean, this is a great thing. You've got to really put it on, you know, all the chief judges murdered and everything. These five radicals did it. And uh, so they, um, they themselves apparently are quite unaware of um, anything except that, the, that who, whoever did it's been caught. And they make inquiry about the five men that they sent down to verify the murder. And the townspeople say, well, we got five in jail, you know, who did it. Don't know whether it's the five you sent down, but it must not be the same ones, because we got the ones that really committed the murder. Anyway, these judges have enough authority to have these five brought out, don't they? To interrogate. And they say, when we got there, he was already dead. Just like Nephi said. And these judges immediately 
did a diabolical thing. What did they do? They said, all right, he was already dead. And what does that prove about Nephi? He's a prophet of God. Oh, they didn't say that. Oh, he's a conspirator. Yeah, he had advanced notice. He pretended it came from God. He was in on it. That's why he had the advance notice. Who defended Nephi? All right, the five men. Are they converted? Yes, they're converted. So you can see what happened to them while they were in the spirit world. They had a little, a little fast crash program. Eight lessons. They got all eight lessons in a very short period of time. All right. Now Nephi is dragged out before kind of a motley people's court. The communists do this all the time. They, uh, when, when Castro uh, wanted to get somebody accused and executed fast, he'd have everybody meet in the Colosseum and, he, and he'd have the person dr brought up and somebody would come out and say, he's a Batista man, uh, etc. And then Castro would turn to the crowd and say, uh, what's your decision? You've heard the accusation, what's your decision? No defense, no nothing. And the people would say in Spanish, to the wall, to the wall. And so he killed 600. We still had the people up here in the United States saying, my, he's for the Constitution. He's a great believer in civil liberties. I used to regurgitate intellectually every time I'd hear it on television. Uh, yeah, the George Washington of Cuba. That's what they called him, George Washington. So um, that's the way these people do. They'll drag you before what they call a people's court. What, re what, is, what is it really? It's a mob. So there's, they're going to accuse uh, Nephi of uh, uh, being involved here and everything. It gives him a chance. He was so disgusted with them. And so he, he unloaded this marvelous sermon on them. And then he ended up and he said, and What made you think that God couldn't reveal this to me like he did to Moses and the other earlier prophets? You accept the fact that God did it for them. What made you think he couldn't do it for me in my day? And now as a further demonstration that God has told me, I will tell you where to go to find the real murderer. This is fantastic. You know, this should have just converted the whole city of Zarahemla, but it didn't. The name of the chief judge who had been murdered was, was what? What was it? Siezrum is the way it's pronounced. It was the Zoramites that constantly were turning toward Gadianism and apostasy. So, what a political group does this man belong to? Gadian. So the Gadians are in charge, which means the Zoramites probably have a, have a big finger in the pie. So if you go to see the chief judge prior to his murder, who do you go to see? You see a Zoramite, see? Caesarum. Caesarum. We pronounce it Caesarum, but it's spelled Caesarum. Caesarum. Then after he's killed, you see Antum. Right? That's his brother. See Antum was his brother. So go to Caesarum, then go see Antum. Now you got it. Caesarum, see Antum. Caesarum, see Antum. Are you with me? Okay. Caesarum, see Antum. Okay. Now you won't. Uh, pronunciation's a little differently, but that's the way you can remember it. All right. He says if you'll go in he, he, and accuse his brother of the murder. I told you in the beginning it was his brother. Now you go in and talk to his brother. I've not seen his brother, but I'll tell you what you can do. You go in and accuse him, and he'll get very frightened, but he'll deny it. You look on his robe. See, Ezra's blood is on that robe. You point that out to him, and he will tremble and fear, and finally he will admit it, and he will tell you that I had nothing to do with it. Now go do that. So they went and did it. It was fantastic. So when they come back, they can't decide what Nephi really is and it breaks into a big argument over whether he's what a prophet or God himself or inspired by the devil can't tell but anyway it was fantastic that he was able to dream it up Rivon couldn't have done any better uh, so um, they get in this big argument and it's rather amazing they, they left Nephi just standing there by himself they got in this big dialogue dialectic big argument and left Nephi standing all there by himself so he just walked off and he's going it says pondering in sorrow toward his house and all of a sudden the spirit of the Lord stops him Nephi go back I am now ready to destroy this people and I want you to tell them that destruction hangs over their heads 
and that if they don't repent, they will be destroyed. And now Nephi, you have labored in the field with what? That's the strangest, most clumsy word. With unwearyingness. And that's that a hard one? Where Joseph Smith came up with that one, I don't know. You see, the whole vocabulary in the Book of Mormon is only 3,000 words. But whatever it said in the Reformed Egyptian, in English, unwearyingness fits it. This is not part of Joseph Smith's ordinary vocabulary. I, I don't find it anywhere in all the, the writings of Joseph Smith. But that was the word that he could come up with which the Spirit would confirm as fitting it. Unwearyingness. It's a little bit clumsy, isn't it? But there's no doubt about its meaning. And that's the great thing about the Book of Mormon. It's clear. It doesn't pretend to be great literature. They warned us, Mormon warned us in advance. He said, I'm writing in a language that's my second language. He said, we're clumsy in this language. I can't even describe some of the things that I've seen in my life. I can't, there are no words for it that I know of. But at least it's clear. And it is. Unwearyingness. You kind of get the feeling, don't you? And that's really typical of him. And so the Lord says, I'm going to give you a very special power. I declare in the presence of whom? The organized priesthood beyond the veil, the angels of the living God, that whatever thou shalt speak shall be done as though it were spoken by whom? By God. Now that meant that all the intelligences in matter, all the priesthood under whom they're organized, are all to recognize that when he commands the clouds not to give forth their rain but to blow over, that there shall be drought and the earth is unproductive, it's to be done. If he speaks to the, this temple, this beautiful temple or magnificent building that Nephi had built, excuse me, Nephi didn't build this one, uh, that had been built actually by Mosiah and his people later on, it will be destroyed at his command. If he says to this mountain, move over and cover up this city, it shall be done. If he speaks to the wind and says, let the storm cease, it shall be done. If he says to the earth to quake, it shall be done. All of these things will obey the priesthood which I now and the authority I now give to Nephi. And then he said to Nephi, I dare to give this power to you, an ordinary mortal man, because I know that what? You'll never ask for anything that is contrary to my will. So whatever you do will be what I would have wanted done anyway. And you will not act without the Spirit of the Lord whispering to you what to do. Now this power was given to Enoch. It was given to Jacob. Uh, Jacob says we could even command trees and have them respond to us. Um, it was given to Joseph Smith. We have no record of the prophet Joseph using it. Uh, but uh, the Lord said that he now had it on one occasion. All right. Nephi took, um, took the necessary time to warn that whole people before this destruction started to move in among them. Now, where's Lehi all this time? His brother. Where was he? Up in the land northward? No. Helping him. Mormon suddenly picks up Lehi's story and says he was not one whit behind Nephi in doing this great work. It makes me wonder where Lehi was the day that Nephi was on the verge of being mobbed and killed. He might have been away on a mission or something. Uh, there are lots of great human interest stories involved here that we don't have. So for two years, these men and all the other believers in the church went forth and tried to warn the people, probably including the five who'd gone down to see if Zeezrom was killed. And at the end of those two years, what happened uh, to the Nephites? What especially had happened? War, war. You see what happens, the Gadiantans, they have a technique of getting everybody agitated. They kill, they, there's guerrilla attacks. Then you start blaming one another, you don't know who did it, and they get this agitation going, and they get a riot, and then they loot. Now this is an old technique, to get violence and then loot. And the very people who provoke the violence are the ones that do the looting. I watched this down in um, uh, Watts. I was there for five days. I watched that rioting. I had, uh, I had known the professional agitators were in there. And um, the incident, uh, they were going to use some explosive incident. Several little things happened. They passed that by. The one that they used wasn't even really consistent. There was a... Um, a drunken um, 
driver, a Negro boy, and he had an accident. And his mother came out and saw that he had the accident and just raised Cain with him, beat on him and for getting drunk and everything. Then the police came along and went through the usual routine, found that he was drunk, started to take him out of the car, and she attacked the officers. She said, you mustn't take him. And they said, lady, well, we have to take him down, at least over his up, etc., etc. And so she was pounding on him, and some other people gathered around and started to throw bottles and things at the police. So other police cars came, and uh, finally um, everything was settled down. The boy was taken out of the area and taken down and booked. Three hours later, all of a sudden, Molotov cocktails came at almost everywhere in the downtown section. They were thrown into the stores, etc., and that and the, the Watts, the Central Avenue section of Watts, exploded. Well, for five days, you couldn't stop it. There were some people who claimed that they represented the colored people there, the Negro people there, and they wanted um, the police to get out of there. They said, we can settle it. Just get the police out of there. Well, the police, Chief Parker, I talked to him afterwards. He said, I, we knew it was agitational, uh, and yet we thought maybe the, uh, some of these leaders that had been so radical, maybe he had some good offices with the, with the rioters, even though they themselves had provoked it, and it was getting out of hand, and, and the people themselves were the victims. Anyway, he said, we removed our police, and that was a terrible mistake, because it just got, it just was worse once the police moved out. So then the militia had to be brought in to try and quiet it down. And there was a big investigation afterwards, and the bleeding hearts all cried for $37 million, etc. Well, Watts area had had more money spent per capita on uh, rehabilitating their houses and getting it sh in shape than any ghetto in the whole United States. And it, Los Angeles had just received an award eight months earlier because of the f the f their effort to try and, and help the people who were there. Those on welfare were getting about $4,200 a year, and tax exempt, you know, which is a lot better than when we went to Los Angeles in 1923 in a depression and lived in tents. Anyway, 4,200. Boy, that would have been great. And we lived in Watts, by the way. So I knew this area. Well, about six weeks later, the Communist Party leader down there, Michael, I'll uh, think of his name in a minute, he called a uh, press conference because he said the Communist Party was not getting proper credit for what it had done. And he told how hard he'd worked. I've got a copy of the press release. Real interesting. He said, we were here for two years to get this thing going. Uh, because we wanted to uh, dramatize the terrible plight of these people. Well, their plight's been worse, of course, ever since. And the $37 million went into the pockets of bureaucrats. It very seldom uh, does any of that money get down on the level where the people are. That's what President Nixon has just gotten through saying. Did you notice that? He really lambasted the channels that are supposed to be helping the poor. They drain off practically all the money before it gets down to about 90% of it. Well, the same thing happened here. So I appeared on radio and television the uh, sometime there and was asked about it. And, I, and by that, at that time, the Communist Party had not come out in the open and admitted what the part they had in it. And they're only part of the picture. The criminal element was in there. There were some other fanatical radicals. But after I had appeared on radio, then um, Sam Yorty, the mayor of, of Los Angeles, came out and he said, this is true. We've identified a lot of these fanatics in here. Well, you'd just be amazed at the, at the looting and so forth. They had it all set up so that once the irresponsible rioting got going, why well, they come in and loot. And, the, and the, as a result, you have a spirit of martial law there for quite a period of time afterwards. And a lot of people capitalized on it, and it was kind of a fraud against everybody, especially the Negroes. They were the victims of a fraud. And... Um, kind of a heartbreaker when you know really what happens in those situations, but we survive it and go on. Now these Gadiatans had done this to, the, to these communities and gotten them so upset and so looted and murdered and killed and attacked and shot till nobody trusts anybody. And then pretty soon you get massive civil war. And you have community against community, family against family. And that's a terrible thing when that breaks out in a society. So they're killing each other by the thousands. And finally, after two years, Nephi can't stand it any longer. And that's when he says to the Lord, Now, Heavenly Father, no rain, please. Stop them. And undoubtedly, during those two years, all the members of the church had been storing up their welfare supplies. They were, they'd been warned. They knew what to expect. 
So you'll find that members of the church going through this period without too much difficulty, the rest of the people starving in what quantity? Thousands upon thousands. And you, stand, you see Nephi the prophet standing by. God has told him he can stop it when he wants to. And he stands there but from 19 B.C. to 16 B.C. These people who would have otherwise been slaughtered by the sword go through this terribly humbling experience of starving to death. And I think our artists really caught the spirit of it in their picture. That's pretty gruesome, but that's the way it is. I watched them in India starving to death, and it's just that terrible. And... Um, uh, then he said, um, I can see some signs of repentance. What encouraged him the most? What did he see them doing that really made him feel good? They started suppressing what? The Gadiantans. Even some of the Gadiantans repented. Then they went to the chief judges and said, plead with Nephi that he'll do something about it. And so they came to Nephi, they pleaded with him, and then he went to the Lord and said, now, as you honored my request before to stop the rains and so we could keep the people from dying from slaughtering each other get them concentrating on looking for food now now can we have some food now that they've repented all right now the rains fell was it what a time for rejoicing unless you've been in a famine stricken area which probably none of you have ever been you have have any of you been in a famine area one or two where was yours in vietnam okay unless you've seen it you you have skin and bone in the jungle of Peru um, she was just saying that um, on uh, Peru you know begins over um, on, by Lima on the Pacific side then it goes right up across the uh, the Andes and then starts down into the other side where the the drainage basin for the um, Amazon River is and the natives that occupy that in fact, most of the Amazon is occupied by, by natives that uh, are on the lowest cultural level in America. And they live um, by the seasons. And as uh, she was saying, um, they drink the filthy water and so forth. Their stomachs are all distended and so forth. And they're just skin and bone. Well, if you've seen people starving, you can understand the rejoicing that occurred at the time the rains fell. Now, is Nephi still unpopular? Still unpopular? Oh, no, they love him. He is the president of the church. Any of them want to be baptized? Oh, it's the end thing. Everybody join the church. It's the end thing. Lasts for how many years? Four. Four years. And those people are doing what they've done over and over and many other people have done too the, the, the Israelites didn't do much better if the Lord raises a people to a high level it's surprising how, how hard it is for them to stay up there it won't matter whether it's Latter day Saints or what it is it's very difficult to hold the people on a high plateau and you think we're busy these days we got you going to meetings at 7 o'clock again at 9 o'clock and at noon or there's a meeting in the afternoon a little auxiliary on the side we got you going to sacrament meeting we got you going Sunday night we got you going Tuesday night right and studying Book of Mormon in between that's how we're ho able to hold about 85% of our people it's never happened before since the days of the golden age of the Nephites and the days of Enoch we're doing it with a highly structured program with all of us involved. And don't complain. It's the greatest thing the brethren can do for us. And the thing to do is to be part of it and be gung-ho about it and be right in there. And you'll find that we will be able to sustain our culture and our people if they'll stay with us. Otherwise, we'll lose them. All you have to do is have a person drop out for three weeks out of activity and they can be in trouble so fast. It's kind of amazing can happen in half an hour as a matter of fact but um, the Lord says meet together often that's what he meant this is the second estate is the trickiest slipperiest experience we've had in all our eternal experience and by highly structuring the program of the church and you've got to depend uh, to determine how much you can absorb and how much is too much but the church wants to be sure it's there for you so that you stay active and busy don't, don't get away from it because if you're not active at this present time, you, you're slipping. You just can't help it. You're just like I am. If you're not active, you're slipping. And our Heavenly Father knows it. So he's told our brethren that in the, during this very difficult stage that we're going now between now and the second coming, 
We just all got to be terrifically involved all week long with things that are exciting and spiritual. We're fasting and praying for one another. We're ministering to the sick. We're storing up supplies. We're doing this to serve one another and doing that. It's just great. All right, they began to degenerate now, and it was just a cycle from 12 B.C. down for the next five years to 6 B.C., next six years. All of a sudden, um, there appears on the scene a man who probably contacted the president of the church when he first arrived, but there's no record of it. What's this man's name? He's from down south. This man comes and goes, and we never hear of him again, which is a tragedy. I'd really like to know the full life story of this man. He comes in among the people, uh, has, he's a member of the church, has his skin been lightened, or is he identifiable as a Lamanite? Apparently still identifiable, clearly identifiable as a Lamanite. Now a little later on, uh, after the birth of Christ, um, nearly all the people, especially the young people who joined the church, become uh, immediately fair. Uh, this is one of the phenomena. Now the Lord warned us in our day that it would be over a period of several generations. But he can do it that fast if he wants to. They become a fair people, light complexioned. And it's just to, uh, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, dark complexioned people like Samuel are less worthy than those that are light complexioned. The Lord just wants to uh, say, I want to make this change just to impress upon you that I'm real pleased with what you're doing. Whether you get the change or not, I'm pleased with what you're doing. We've had some of our Polynesians turn uh, light complexioned in one generation. but. Nobody who's light complexion must suddenly get a superiority complex over the, oh, those of us who are a little swarthy, you see. <laughs> okay? Got to make that clear. <clears throat> some have blonde hair, some have black hair, some have brown hair, some don't have any hair. But anyway, <clears throat> um, it's what's inside a person that really counts. In any event, Samuel comes among them and he has three basic messages. Three basic messages that I want you to be sure and remember. And uh, the first one that he gives is absolutely uh, incomprehensible. Why, he, why the Lord wanted to do this, I really can't figure out. And I suppose Samuel couldn't either. But what was controlling what Samuel said? Yes, yeah, the, the angel said, go back and tell them what? What was he to tell them? Did the angel give him the message he was to tell them? No, the angel didn't give him any message. It just said to go back and do what? And the Lord will put in your heart. Now just what you're to say. So he climbs. He's been thrown out of the city once. And it wasn't done by a mob. It was done by the government officials. Because when he comes back at the gate. He can't get in. I mean the officials don't let him in. So he climbs up this high wall. Which we have reason to believe was a stone wall. Um, they started out with dirt. And ended up with stone where they could. And, and Zarahemla was there main city so it was undoubtedly stone he gets up real high and the marketplaces are usually near the gates so we think that's probably where he was and he gets up here and he's looking down on this crowd and he starts talking to them and what does the Lord start talking about first of all birth of Christ no what does he start talking about the annihilation of the Nephites when's that's coming yeah 400 years 400 years well it, he goes on and on for a whole chapter about that that's kind of amazing. Then he comes down and around to the present. And he says, in, when five years have passed, I want you to notice that he didn't say, in five years. He said, when five years have passed, you will see great signs which will indicate what? The birth of Christ in the land of Jerusalem. Now, this was a cause of great dispute when the five years had passed, because nobody knows now, the five years have passed. Okay, all right, when do we have the signs? See, there's going to be a great dispute as to whether or not uh, this is being fulfilled or not. Five years have passed, and some said, now it's supposed to happen right now. And, uh, well, it was to happen sometime after five years had passed. And every member of the church almost got killed. Because it went on and on and on, there were still no signs. They were going to execute every member of the church for believing this myth. And the, the signs came in the nick of time, within 24 hours. That was really a tight one, but that's getting ahead of the story. All right, now he said, I, I have some more signs to tell you about. What was the third thing that Samuel testified about? The death of Christ. Now, he testified that when Christ died, 
when he was crucified, some terrific things were going to happen. And he identified them. He actually described them. And uh, how long did he say that the earthquakes and the tempest and the, and the shaking of the earth and the, and the mountains falling on top of cities and the ground opening up and swallowing whole uh, uh, peoples and being carried off in a whirlwind, how long did he say that would last? How long? Right, now watch it. His prophecy is general. It's many hours. He never describes how many. Okay, it'll be for many hours. How, how many hours did it turn out to be? Three. Three. Then he said there will be darkness. Now this time he was specific. And he said there'll be a pall of darkness that'll settle over the land for how long? Three days. Three days. Now he was very specific about that. I just wanted you to kind of catch that little refinement there. All right. So, um, for three hours, yes, the storm only lasted apparently while, while uh, the three hours probably that Christ was on the cross and it was dark over in Jerusalem and there was an earthquake over there. Those three terrible hours of darkness are probably the time of anguish on our continent when the whole face of the land was changed. Be sure and get your pickup as you go out the door, your handout I should say for Thursday.